Hi, everybody. This is Dave Vellante, and welcome to Cube Conversations. We're going to talk about modernizing network infrastructure with a friend of ours, Rich Napolitano, who's the CEO of Plexi. I'm joined by Paul Gillen. Rich, it's great to see you again. Great to see you, David. So it was about a year ago, a um, little over, we were down at Big Data NYC. <laughs> you came on. You had just taken over as a CEO of Plexi. You popped out of you know, EMC after a great career there. Obviously, son, longtime New England technology executive. So... Give us the update. How's Plexi doing? What's uh, what's the first year been like? No, it's, uh, it's been well. Thank you. It's great to be here and spend some time with Paul and you, as always. Uh, it's always a fun conversation, so uh, I'm looking forward to it. Um, it's been a great year. Uh, we um, we uh, end of last year we released our uh, the product as the basis of our uh, momentum this year. We've talked in the past about growing our revenues uh, 10x uh, this year, and we're on track to do that. So I'm really excited about that. Team's been working really, really hard. Um, as a startup, um, I think you know you got to simplify things that are complicated. So, you know, I focus on three things every single day. First is <clears throat> you raise capital, and we'll talk about that. Um, you got to deliver products, um, and you got to sell those products. And you know, my day consists of working on those three things. Uh, so, we shipped uh, at the end of last year our 2.2 so uh, 2.1 software and our, our new. Uh, Switch to platforms, and that became the basis of our revenue expansion this year. And we're making great progress there. Some marquee customers and great momentum on that front. <clears throat> in addition, uh, we announced in the summer that we signed Arrow as our, our distributor, and Arrow uh, working very closely with them to, to recruit a new kind of partner. Uh, we call them cloud builders, which we'll talk more about, I think, later in the conversation. And uh, these are partners that are helping customers build public and private cloud infrastructure for the future. Um, and uh, so, you know, deliver products, uh, build out your go-to-market, and raise capital. And in August, uh, we announced a $35 million round uh, with some new investors uh, and uh, to really enable our expansion around our go-to-market. So talk a little bit more about Plex. I mean, everybody talks about traffic, network traffic transitioning from north-south to east-west, but you guys take it a step further. I mean, I kind of look at you like DevOps for networking, but, but talk mm -hmm. a little bit mm -hmm. more about how you're different there. Yeah, I mean, DevOps networking is not a bad way to think about it. Um, the, you know, the requirements in this new era, and we talked about this, I think, the last time I saw you, were shifting, and we see that very clearly now, and the market's clearly coming to, coming to us. Uh, so part of it is the nature of traffic. It's really the nature of applications have changed. And you know, you know, for 20 years, applications were client server oriented and you'd send a request down to a client and you'd get your result and that, that resulted in north-south traffic. Uh, more and more applications scale horizontally now or scale out. And so you see more traffic going east-west, whether that's you know, big data environments where you know, Hadoop and things shard out requests or whether it be VMware environments where you have more and more VMs connected and then you have operations that are causing cross cross-network traffic like vMotion, things that cause the network to work both north-south and east-west when the prior architectures were really designed for north-south traffic. But it's not just about traffic. It's whatever, the big learning uh, this year for us is that these cloud builders, they want to build um, public and private clouds that are tremendously agile. And the traditional network architectures are very, very rigid. Uh, traditional networks are really uh, when they're implemented, your architecture is locked in. Um, we kind of jokingly call them wire-defined networks. They are defined by their wires and their cables. The day that you cable it, your architecture is determined, your connectivity is determined, your bandwidth is determined, and your bandwidth is locked in that cable. And in our architecture, we would say that our architecture is just more flexible. Our architecture is, we generally don't use SDN because that has too many load means. We, we would say that our network is a network that can be defined by software. In some respects, the opposite of SDN, it's NDS. <laughs> so our network can be defined by software. So if you're gonna have a network that can be defined by software, then you have to have our founder, Dave Husak, awesome guy, MIT guy, um, uh, figure this out. And he, he loves saying, if you're gonna have a network that's defined by software, you better have a definable network. In other words, a network that's not defined by its cables. So yeah, what you're talking about, it's gotta be a little scary for, <clears throat> uh, for a uh, enterprise IT guy who's got a big uh, north-south architecture, as you're talking about, I mean, those apps are not going to change, the structure is not going to change. How are you fitting into this structure? So, um, the, uh, the, the key thing about our product is that it's both future-proofing and kind of new architecture and compatible with the legacy. And I think 
Um, you know, the world, having been in technology now for over 35 years, uh, you know, we, we, declare the, we declare the end of eras very, very quickly, and the tail is enormous as we know. And so any new technology needs to embrace the incumbency by some, in some means, uh, especially in the enterprise. So our product has those properties, which is southbound, we are a very traditional, you know, uh, layer three to one networking stack. Uh, so we are fully compatible. I mean, we use Broadcom chips, which really define the standard for interfacing, you know, whether it be Cisco or Arista, you, you name the company, they all use exactly the same components. And so the very traditional networking protocols we support. So you southbound, you can plug our networks into existing networks and cap your investment in that and then grow in a much more agile way. Because it, it's not just about east-west, it's really about agility. It's really about allowing people to build, say, private clouds that are as easy to use and consume as public clouds. Well, you, you, you've got apps that are built on this north-south architecture, mm -hmm. and, and you want to get them to, to, to the new world. I mean, is that a, it sounds like an unnatural act. And since you're app-driven, what's your role in, in making that happen? So um, even these uh, traditional uh, north-south oriented app applications, as you, as you virtualize them, you cause problems in these environments because many of these apps were written in eras when the infrastructure was totally dedicated to them. So now you put them in a virtualized environment and you have many different applications on the same infrastructure, except you're using the same static network ar architecture. So as you virtualize these applications, what you can cause is hotspots in your network. So what our network would do is looks at these applications by integrating into them. So part of the, the aha of Plexi is become application aware. If you read a lot of our material, you know, application-centric networks is often we talk about. And so we actually look into these APIs of these operating environments like, say, VMware or Salesforce.com or Hadoop or other applications and understand the nature of these requirements and then what we call fit and render. We fit, we calculate the optimized topology for these applications and then we implement that topology dynamically in the network. So there's a lot there. So you're talking about asset leverage on the existing uh, infrastructure, <clears throat> and you're talking about being able to modernize the application portfolio without ripping and replacing it. Correct. And then you also mentioned application-centric. It's a term that Cisco uses. Yes. So, so juxtapose what you guys are doing versus the, the big whale in the business. So it's actually very interesting. Um, even just recently, um, a lot of the analysts are picking up that what we have built is very similar to ACI, except the difference is that um, the um, ACI is really built on what, what we would call a platform two oriented network architecture, traditional leaf and spine, or a wire defined network, right? So they haven't fundamentally changed the underlying substrate of the network. They're, they're solving a very complex application oriented problem. Mm. Um, we, we would say that you need both. In fact, we're actually very friendly to things like NICERA or other overlays. We don't want to be the overlay. We want to be a great underlay to enable, you know, um, uh, you know, uh, whether it be Alcatel's virtualization or VMware's you know, network virtualization. We're very friendly to those environments because it turns out that our network is so dynamic that these overlays can tell us what topology they want, and we can change that topology. So, to be specific, in a, say a VMware. Um, environment, we can understand that certain nodes in the VMware are actually part of one cluster. And we can create a topology that says these are all grouped together. Um, and so how do we do that is we have integrations into VMware or potentially Nuage, right, where we look at the requirements for these grouping, same in Hadoop. And then since our network is defined not by cables, but by photonics, right, so we can shape our physical layer by using, uh, uh, it's not really mirrors, but conceptually mirrors that basically say that this group of nodes is on red, you're on blue, you're on green, I'm on purple, and on one physical network, we can actually be talking to each other separately and discreetly. And I can change that once a second if I want. Because okay. if I group and fit and render, it, you got it. So that's a what you're calling a platform three technology, but you're not, you're, you're able to plug into the platform two infrastructure. Bring them so you're like a 2.5 or so you know, the three we're, ready? We're a, we're a, it's actually, a, I think Tucci often uses 2.5, which we're kind of fond of as well. But um, so we can bridge, you need to bridge. 
right. right? Because you need to bring people forward. Everything just can't be ripped and replaced. So the fact that we integrate into VMware, where um, if, if you really think about it, if you go back to, to the early days of VMware, when uh, EMC acquired them and I had just joined right shortly after that, VMware uh, was very successful in test and dev. And the moment that Intel created multi-core and the instruction set, then VMware really accelerated. Mm -hmm. Because effectively, the underlying substrate of compute became very favorable to the VMware environment. We would say that we're exactly the same thing to the network because the underlying substrate of the network now in traditional servers is you might have one or two you know, network adapters or four in a, in a server. So you have all these virtualized networks, whether it be Nuage or NSX, and they tunnel down to just a couple of MAC addresses. Our network has thousands of paths because we're photonic. So we can, we're effectively like a multi-cord network underneath these overlays. That is very different, back to your original question, that is very different than anyone else in the market. So what, and the catalyst, what's the analog to multi-core for you? Is it convergence? Is it just all that complexity? It's diversity. Yeah. It's the, we would say diversity, so that we don't have just one path, or two or three or four paths. We have thousands of paths in our network between any two points. It's as, it's as if, you know, if you were to travel from Boston to New York, there's probably three or four ways you always go. You take Route 90, 86, you know the drill. Take the Merit. Right? Yeah, right. <laughs> but there are probably thousands of ways to get there, not just the Merit. What if you could know that? And what if you could dynamically change your pathing, like you do in some of the new phone apps? Not ways as for networking. Ways, ways for, for networking. networking, yeah. yeah. <laughs> right? And that's, that is the nature of what we're doing, yeah. which is so, very different than anyone else. Cool. So how would you think about network management differently? I mean, what does network management look like in the scenario that you're building? So really what we want, our ultimate manifestation is we want to be invisible. We want the network to be invisible. We are so well integrated into VMware and OpenStack now, this is part of our announcement last week, that the bulk of network administration goes away. It just goes away. And we look inside of VMware environment, there are five types of network traffic in a VMware environment. There's the internode traffic, there's the storage traffic, there's the logging traffic, there's the control traffic, and there's the vMotion traffic. There's five different network types. We can distinguish every one of them and create a network topology that's optimized for VMware. Period. That's what we do. So it is intended to be idiot-proof. Uh, really, the, the network manager, we're getting, we're does the need for a network manager go away? It never really goes away. I mean, we saw, um, we saw the same thing years ago. Um, so I was the exec sponsor for the Isilon acquisition. And so at that time uh, at EMC, I was running a mid-range, so you know the biggest you know, part of the NAS uh, group was my group. And, uh, but we realized there was limits in our architecture and that we needed to get to a scale-out, a scale-out, that's a Freudian slip, a scale-out uh, file system, and Isilon represented that. And at the time, everybody was very worried, like what happens to administrators? And I remember we used to measure this. We used to say, you know, in the VNX era, um, you know, administrator could manage you know, 100 terabytes. Well, that same administrator in Iceland can manage dozens of petabytes now. Mm. Do you think they're unhappy? Because you yeah. know what? We took the misery away. Yeah. We took the misery away, and we want to do the same thing in a network. I want to talk, talk about scale out, because so many network functions are, are, have been historically scale up. Uh, yes. You have to add on top yes. of the, the infrastructure, there's bigger switches, uh, yes. bigger paths. I, I mean, my understanding was that there were functions of networks that just couldn't be scaled out. Are you uh, saying that's not the case? Yeah, that's not the case. So we have customers using us in the data center. We have customers that are using us around metropolitan areas. And we have one customer that's part of this announcement, um, uh, Perseus, who deployed a 34,000 mile network around the Pacific Ocean. I can't tell you who the end user customer is. They'd kill me, but you'd be amazed at who the customer is, okay? And they control all of that from New York City. They provision VLANs between you know, the west coast of California and Tokyo by telling the network, I want a VLAN between here and here. They don't touch dozens or hundreds of devices in the network. And they control it all from New York City. They've told us now they could never build such a network and, and have so few people managing it. We fully distribute the control function. So we can do that in the data center, around a metropolitan area, and at global scale and we do it with exactly the same product. There's not a difference between our product used in the data center, around a metropolitan area, or at 34,000 miles. Mm -hmm. It's the same product. What we require is a wire. We need a wire. 
So undersea cables is a wire to us. It has different characteristics. It took us some time to get that to work. <laughs> it was a little scary yep. for a while because <laughs> we had never tested a network that big because we're a startup, but we got it to work. And so you know, we've proven that you can scale these things. Let's talk about the route to market. You did a deal with Arrow. Um, you know, one of the least talked about things in the, the Dell e e EMC acquisition mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. is the channel. That's right. Um, and you know, Gartner has their swim lane model, which is pretty good model. Yep. You got the, the, yep. the box movers, you yep. got the sort of guys yep. doing more integration, yep. focused on Oracle, SAP, VMware, you know, moving up the stack, and then you got this sort of new breed of cloud guys doing, doing DevOps. How do you see um, that channel shifting, and how are you trying to take advantage of that? No, that's a, that's a great question. Um, so this is probably the thing we're most excited about. I mean, this announcement to us is not just a product announcement. Um, it's, it's a year of learning uh, of our battle grow to market. So uh, as I said, we shipped our you know, enterprise ready product in Q4 of last year and, and it's the basis of our revenue, but we've learned a lot. And, and startups need to be very adept and just you know, keep learning and refining your selling motion. And what we have learned is that there's a new customer out there and we call them the cloud builders we, or cloud architects. And they think very, very differently about the infrastructure. Um, they think about it not from you know, the, the Cisco switch or the EMC array. They really think about the applications and the business problem they're trying to solve. They think more like what we would call a platform two system integrator, more from the top down. And because the nature of the customer is changing, there's a new partner that's emerging. And they're cloud builder partners. And a, a lot of the reason why we spent a bunch of time with the Arrow guys and recruited them and have been very focused on 100% channel oriented business model is to create this next generation partner, to enable them. And what those next generation partners need are technology tools um, that they can use as cloud builders to shape the infrastructure the way they need it. Because I think gone are the days when people want to buy a Cisco switch or an EMC array and that has a fixed function. <clears throat> it's more DevOpsy, as you pointed out, right? And these guys, they don't want you know, very rigid, rigid components that, that can't be assembled in unique ways where they can't change. So Plexi, one of the things that's unique about Plexi is we're really a tool for the cloud builders, whether they be a partner or an end user. And that tool can be shaped by the mechanisms we talked about a minute ago. So your value prop for them is you're eliminating a lot of that non-differentiated stuff down, down low and allowing them to focus further up on their value delivery. Like for example, like this 34,000 mile network, it has no MPLS in the whole entire network. There's none. I don't know anybody likes MPLS, <laughs> okay? It, there's none. So all that complexity is removed, right? Talk, talk about, you referred to, to this, this announcement a few times, you should tell people what that is. It's the, the uh, Cloud Builder 2.2 software suite and the new Switch 3 100 gig E hardware platform yes. just announced last week. Yes. Uh, tell us what's, what's breakthrough about these. Yes, so um, again, the focus on this Cloud Builder uh, customer and partner is fundamental. It's kind of our biggest learning actually for this year. And so the announcement was about a set of capabilities, mostly in software and then in one additional new hardware platform uh, that we announced. Um, the capabilities are really in two dimensions on the software side. Uh, we announced uh, Plexi Connect, a new set of plugins and uh, software that allow us to look into OpenStack and VMware environments to understand the nature of the requirements in these environments and then pr present that information uh, to what we call Plexi Connect. And there's a set of new services um, that I won't go through them all, but I'll, I'll hit you know, one or two. Uh, for example, one of our customers wants us to isolate specific lambdas in our network in a topology around, you know, around multiple switches. So they can basically snap in you know, uh, Docker or NSX or other services that want to partition the applications, uh, but then have a physical control all the way through the network that says, you know, this blue goes all the way through all of these switches end to end and no traffic shall be on this or not. In some respects, it's the opposite of the algorithms we've been building up to this point, which shape the network dynamically for mm -hmm. them. This is isolating these capabilities. But these are tools that these cloud builders want to, to, to achieve their business objectives, in this case, security and isolation end to end. Um, also, we put in capabilities where, <clears throat> you know, things like, you know, uh, uh, vSAN or Scale.io or other storage oriented traffic, we could distinguish the nature of that traffic and separate out, you know, whether it be metadata traffic for say vSAN 
or uh, regeneration traffic of rebuilds or user traffic and separate those out on our networks seamlessly so the end user, in fact, one of the challenges we have is you can't demo it because it just works. <laughs> it just, the network is dynamically shaped. I mean, we're so well integrated into VMware now that when you do a vMotion, we actually effectively wire a separate network for the period of time you're doing a vMotion and then return that resource. So in a lot of enterprises, they shut off vMotion. They say you can't use that. Well, why is that? Because I built this leaf and spine. I put all these applications uh, on this, you know, you know, the virtualized environment, say VMware. I have hundreds of apps, and then I have this vMotion, which blasts, you know, terabytes of storage east-west through my network. You have non-deterministic results. We don't have that on our network. We just see the vMotion. We say it's going from here to here. Let's create a separate network for that duration. When the vMotion is done, we return the resource. How, how important is the hardware component to your business? Is this uh, an, uh, is there an NFV uh, sort of uh, future for you? So, um, see, I, I call me old-fashioned, right? But I think people want to buy like whole products uh, in the enterprise. I think you have the the, the big web scale dudes who you know have engineering groups bigger than EMCs. Um, and they can build whatever they want, so I don't spend a lot of time trying to sell to them. Um, then you have some of the big banks that have a lot of resources. You know, um, I think people want finished products. I think they want hardware, software, because I think they want to know that it's going to be serviced. You know, one of the powers of EMC and one of the greatest lessons I learned at EMC is uh, you know the importance of the customers knowing that you will make them right, that you're you you will take responsibility for the entire stack. And that's what we do. So hardware is important from that perspective. A lot of our innovation isn't in hardware. <laughs> if you look at our hardware, it's totally off the shelf. I mean, we use Broadcom chips, we use Intel processors, and we use DWDM components that are used to fiber to your home. There's no innovation there. From, we put it together in kind of an interesting way, but this announcement is about actually a white box that is a Tomahawk-based system, and we, we manifest our software on that. So it's table stakes to a solution. Yeah, right. It's table. You want a solution. I just uh, some people will disaggregate you. I I think that's a mistake. I don't think enterprises really generally want to do that. Let's talk about um, scale because that's really your big challenge. Are <laughs> right, you mm -hmm. scaling the company? Your recent round, you raised thirty-five million. Um, I was just out in Palo Alto <clears throat> last week. Of course, I go out there all the time. If you walk down you know, the Rosewood Hotel and you see a million people that you yep. know, we're East Coast guys, right? <laughs> yeah, yep. and so. And now we see, you know, the big East Coast company is merging with the, with an Austin-based company. Still going to be here, big presence here. But so, talk about scale. How you scale this company? Have you raised enough money? Um, what's the plan? So we talked about the three things, right? Yep. Raise money, stay alive, <laughs> sell stuff, build build stuff, sell stuff. Uh, so I always do three. I'm always raising money. It's just what you do, right? So you're always raising the next round. So mm -hmm. I'm always raising money. The good news is there's lots of capital out there. Uh, so I don't really focus on that as my day job because I think if, if we sell enough stuff, uh, then uh, all, the, all the other problems will be solved. So, so I focus on selling. I, I ask a lot of execs a lot of capital. who have startups, particularly you know storage guys, like you've seen you know the Pure IPO, mm -hmm. you're seeing a bunch of other you know storage companies, flash guys. Can they can they reach escape velocity the same way that Isilon did and Three Par did and and Compellent you know to to a certain extent did as well. What does it take today to reach escape velocity? So I think, um, you know, this is a change of huge, a time of huge change, right? So some of the traditional, you know, classic OEM models, I mean, I, I can remember several startups ago, you know, you had to have an OEM component in the storage business, otherwise you couldn't really take off. Um, and so that's very confused now because all the big guys are very confused. They're all restructuring in some way. Um, the good news is that you know we, there's no accident that we signed Arrow because there was an emergence of a new kind of partner mm -hmm. that's reaching these customers. And uh, the good news uh, is that the big guys are pretty confused, and they're everyone, whether it be IBM or HP or Oracle or EMC, they're they're all concentrating their selling motion at their top customers, and that's just a huge opportunity for us guys that are coming into the market. You know, Pure ran that play. You know, you look at Arista. Arista's play is a little bit different. <clears throat> their plays to concentrate in Cisco's top account, and they're doing a great job. Doing great, they're Jay doing Shree's great. Jay is awesome. She's yeah. unbelievable. They're doing a great job. We're a different cat, right? Because we're different, right? We're a different cat. You, uh, I mean, you talk about Cisco. Uh, obviously, 
going to be impacted by what you do. Is Cisco, do you see them as being a competitor of yours? Are they a potential acquirer? Are they a partner? Uh, you know, can they get to do what you do? Well, I mean, take three years and, you know, $75 million, $85 million, and you can build anything, right? And it's just that easy. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Having built a lot no of risks in my career. Yeah. Right? <laughs> so, yeah, anybody could do it. Uh, <laughs> Uh, and, it, and it's hard. I mean, these things are big, complicated, and um, you know, having lived in the enterprise for over 30 years, it really has to work. It's not. I'm sorry, no offense, West Coast, but it's not a website. So uh, it has to work, and that's a real challenge. Um, Cisco is, you know, 80 depending on whose math you use, 80 percent market share in the enterprise. They're everywhere. Uh, is that a handicap or is that an asset or a handicap it, it in trying to, in trying it to restructure? Uh, sometimes uh, people are looking for alternatives, so we're very favorable in that. Um, generally, if, if it's just a port refresh deal with Cisco, I don't even bother to show up. There's no reason for me to show up. They should buy from Cisco or they should buy from Arista. We're, we're looking at the cloud builder. Okay, so what if it's not a port refresh deal, but the, the customer is still nervous, <laughs> small company. What's the customer imperative? How do you get, sort of get them through that knot hole? So, um, we, we've, I can't tell you my wholesale strategy. <laughs> I, can't, I, can't, I, can't, I can't do that. I can't really honestly can't, because I would play my cards. But we, we look for the agents of change. Uh, we look for the, and they could be the networking guy. Um, they're generally a cloud builder though. They're generally not they're not married to you know, ECMP or MPLS or any kind, of, any kind of protocol thing. They're not religious about those things. They think more about the infrastructure and what they're trying to accomplish. And you know, we know we have a customer, and this happens in every meeting, uh, that, that ends up transforming into a customer. Um, they go, ah, this is different. You tell me how to solve this problem. Because I've been trying to solve it for the last 20 years, and I'm really not happy. Mm -hmm. When they have the epiphany like, this is different. These, there are different ways to solve these problems that I've been working on for a long time. And you've removed so much complexity from this problem, I need to think differently about it. That's when we have them. That's so when they're it's, it's those guys that get that it's a 10x value proposition with virtually infinite ROI, that they couldn't do it before and now they can and do it. And it's not it. about CapEx. So I yeah. think a right. lot of what's happening in a networking space is everybody's so focused on CapEx, that's, that's a joke. I don't know why people even bother. Because people don't have a CapEx problem. Because 90% mm -hmm. of their spend is OpEx. Right. So people would trade OpEx for CapEx any day mm -hmm. if you give them a case. And you know, one of these use cases that we haven't really gone into, one of our customers, they're taking their head counts and shifting them from the networking to other things. Like thousands yeah. to hundreds. And you know, the TCO associated with that is off the charts. You, so, you touched on it before. I mean, you know, Amazon, they, they don't need <clears> it. But the enterprise is going to spend money on a solution to save time, right. any, to any day, and, re and reallocate that time at the telephone numbers that far exceed the, the capex of a box, Correct. no question. All right, Rich, awesome as usual seeing you. Thanks so much for, no, for coming in. I'll give you the last word, sort of what do you want people to, to leave this session with uh, around Plexi? If you're a cloud builder partner, we're looking for you. Uh, <laughs> Great. <laughs> that's key to our go-to-market. That is so key to our go-to-market. And what type of people are you hiring right now? Uh, mostly go to market side, uh, so um, uh, guys that sell into the enterprise uh, and that know how to work with partners, keep beating that drum, and then a few kind of fill-in engineering guys. But we generally have a good beat on those because we we know the talent base. Right. Well, Rich, thanks for coming into the studios today. Really appreciate it. Great. Good to see you again. All right. Thanks for watching, everybody. We'll see you next time. This is Paul Gillen with Dave Vellante. Thanks for watching. <laughs>